Hello, everyone. Welcome to the keynote. I'm sorry about the Hall of Fame presentation that didn't happen five minutes ago. We'll figure out what to do and, and get it on later in the day. So now we're starting the second keynote. And I'm wondering if you've seen a theme in the keynotes yet. Both are employing accelerators in an attempt to answer the ultimate questions of life, the universe, and everything. Um, we couldn't have asked for a better segue from Phil Harris's Large Hadron talk yesterday. At the end, he put up a slide full of telescopes, and about half of them were radio telescopes. And he started to talk about um, filtering cosmic data for deep learning and astrophysics. And today, we're going to hear about the search for ET. Dan Wertheimer is the chief scientist of UC Berkeley's SETI Research Center. He was responsible for the algorithmic component of SETI at home and was a member of the Homebrew Computer Club along with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And instead of becoming ultra rich, Dan went on to search for ET and we get to benefit today and hear about it. So thank you for coming, Dan, and take it away. Uh, thanks, Michael. Can, um, so I wanna talk to you about this question, are we alone? Is, is anybody out there? And a little bit about how we're using FPGAs in, in that search. You probably know it's called SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And this is the theoretical approach to answering the question, are we alone? Um, and uh, so this is Frank Drake, who wrote the Drake equation in 61. And on the left of that equation, N, that's the number of civilizations in our Milky Way galaxy. And all you have to do is multiply those variables on the right together. And the problem with this approach is that we don't know what any of those variables are. So it's a way to take a big question, are we alone, and break it up into smaller questions. Actually, we do know a little bit about some of the first things. The, this is kind of a whittling down process. The way this equation works is you, you start with the number of stars in the galaxy, a couple hundred billion, and they say, well, how many of those have planets? And the next thing is, well, if you have a good planet, is it have, does it have the right environment for life? And the next factor is, if you have a good planet with the right environment, how, how often do you get life? That's F sub L. And then the next thing is, okay, if you get life, how often do you get intelligence? That's F sub I for intelligence. And then the next factor is, okay, you got intelligence. How often do you get communicative civilizations? Do they develop FPGAs in ways that we could communicate with them? That's F sub C, communication. And then the last factor is how long do they live? As soon as they develop FPGAs and ways to communicate with us, uh, do they also develop weapons and blow themselves up? We don't know, but some stars are 10 billion years old. Our star is 5 billion years old. We're sort of middle-aged, so they could live a long time. They could be billions of years ahead of us, um, but we really don't know, so we got to go out and look. You can't use this kind of theoretical approach. So um, one of the factors I mentioned was how many planets are there, and if you'd asked me 30 years ago, are there planets going around other stars, um, astronomers would have said, well, we just don't know. We think so, but that changed in, in most of our lifetimes, um, and the reason it took a long time for us to figure out if there are planets going on other stars is that planets are little dinky things. A million Earths could fit inside the sun. They're right next to these really bright things. They're really, you can't see them with telescopes, but you can see them indirectly. So when a planet um, goes around a star, it pulls on the star, the star wiggles a little bit, and that uh, creates a kind of Doppler shift. When it's moving toward you, the light gets a little bluer. When it's moving away, it not doesn't move very much, just kind of walking speed, but you can detect these with a really good spectrometer, slight color shifts apart in a million. And then you can infer the, the wiggling star betrays the presence of a planet. So here's a wiggling star um, over 18 years or so, or eight years or so. And you can kind of, if you can do Fourier transforms in your head, you can see there's sort of two wiggles. There's a slow wiggle and a fast wiggle. And that, that tells you there's a couple planets going around this star. That was one of the, the first planet I think it was the first double planetary system discovered. There's a new way to discover planets, um, which is the occultation technique. When the planet, I don't know if you can see that little black dot there, when the planet gets in front of the star, uh, it blocks a little bit of light, not much, but um, and that's why you have to have this telescope in space because the stars, when they it, try to do this on the ground, the stars twinkle from the atmosphere, the light goes up and down. But if you do this in space and you see a, a star that occasionally dims, that means there's a planet going in front of it. And from the amount of the dim, you can you can figure out the diameter of the planet. And from how often the, the dimming happens, you can figure out the period, the orbit, how long their year is. 
And now we know of thousands of planets and we can infer from just the thousands that we've discovered that there are more planets than there are stars. There are a trillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy and a couple hundred billion galaxies. So lots of planets and good planets. So this is, um, uh, these ones in the green zone are called the habitable zone, or a lot of people call it the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, you don't want to be living in here. Not too cold in the blue stuff, but the, in the Goldilocks zone. So we know that now there are good planets, rocky planets. We know they have liquid water, some of them, and kind of nice, comfortable temperatures. Uh, so um, the next question you might remember is if you have a good planet, do you get life? And that one, now we're starting to get into the unknowns. We don't know how life got started on Earth, but we think something like this, the primordial soup. And people have done experiments where they simulate the early Earth. So what you do is we knew we know that there was methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen around when the Earth was forming. And you put those gases uh, in a flask. And we also know there was lightning. So you make some sparks and you don't get gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get amino acids the kind of basic buildings blocks of life. So we're beginning to understand how you go from simple molecules to complicated uh, proteins and things that you need to make uh, uh, self-replicating molecules like RNA and DNA. But that picture is sort of incomplete. But we're sort of optimistic about life because it happened very quickly on Earth. As soon as the Earth cooled down, um, the oldest rocks you can find have microfossils in them. So the fact that it happened quickly leads us to think it's probably a fairly common process, but we really don't know. Um, the next factor you might remember is, well, if you get primitive life, do you get intelligence? And that that's happened several times here on Earth in, independently. We, we're not really sure that how often that happens or how quickly it happens. It took a long time to get humans on Earth, four billion years. Um, but um, we think that on some planets, there will be selection pressures, evolutionary selection pressures where intelligence is favored. And so on some of these planets, you might get intelligent creatures. There may be, even be life in our own backyard. So this is a moon going around Jupiter called Europa. It's got a liquid ocean, unfortunately covered with about 30 miles of ice. We're trying to figure out how to drill through that ice and see if there's something swimming in the ocean. But there's another moon that you don't even have to drill through the ice. So this is Enceladus going around Saturn. It's got the same deal with the uh, liquid ocean, but the ice has got cracks in it, these fissures, and these uh, some of the water is squirting out. And maybe we could fly through the plumes and sample the uh, water and see if there's uh, some live material in the plumes of Enceladus. That That is likely to happen, I think in the next 10 or 20 years or so. Uh, okay, I wanna talk about intelligent life. Um, it's very unlikely that there are uh, intelligent creatures uh, on Enceladus uh, right in our own backyard, but we may have simple life in our own backyard. But intelligence is probably, we're gonna have to go further than that. So th the field I think you probably know is called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And I'm not the first guy to, work on SETI, 200 years ago, the mathematician Gauss uh, suggested that we make large geometric structures on Earth, a, a big right triangle of pine trees, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, a big square of dirt, big square of wheat, big square of water, and ET would look down with their big telescope and see that we knew about the Pythagorean theorem and they might get in touch. It was a really cool idea, but unfortunately not funded. Um, Von Littron also 200 years ago suggested we get in touch with the ET by digging a circular ditch 20 miles across, fill the ditch with kerosene, and then use this match, not to scale, to make a bright, uh, a fire, a bright circle of light. And same deal, ET would look down and see that we, um, and uh, perhaps they'd see this bright circle of light and perhaps get in touch. It met with a similar fate, also not funded, it was a cool idea at the time, though. Charles Crow, also 200 years ago, suggested that we uh, get in touch with the Martians by using large mirrors to reflect sunlight to the Martians, actually several mirrors, uh, one where he lived in Paris and the others in Europe to outline the, the shape of, of the Big Dipper. And um, I think you can guess what happened with that. Um, the first funded project was to send a pornography into space. Um, this was the plaque on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft. 
And um, the here's the solar system with the sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth. And you can see the path of the spacecraft here. And um, these are directions to pulsars with the timing of these pulsars. So ET will know where we live and could come and eat us if they want. These were very controversial. Uh, they were originally holding hands, but then people said, well, they might think it's one creature instead of two. There's the spacecraft behind them so they know how big we are. So that was the first uh, funded uh, kind of outreach to ET. Um, so one of the ideas in SETI is that Earthlings have been sending a lot of television and radio. I think a lot of you work on communication, so you know about this. This is television power leaving the Earth as a function of time. So you can see early television shows. We've been um, sending out television now for 60 years. The early television shows, I Love Lucy, Ed Sullivan, have gone past about 10,000 stars. And the Earth has been getting brighter and brighter, growing exponentially. This is a log axis. And um, the nearby stars have seen The Simpsons. And uh, we, so anyway, be careful what you say if you're on TV or radio or radar signals, GPS, all that stuff goes out through the ion sphere traveling at the speed of light. So if we're doing that, if ET's out there, maybe, maybe they do that too. Maybe we could detect some kind of accidental signal, some kind of communication or navigational beacon or radar signal. Um, maybe, maybe they even send us something deliberately. We've sent out deliberate signals. This was a, a, a an image that was sent out in the 70s uh, with a two megawatt transmitter on the Arecibo telescope. And it was uh, sent with um, a prompt. It was sent. We, we think images might be a good way to communicate. They're not going to speak English. Um, and it was sent for about two minutes, beamed toward a, a globular cluster 25,000 light years away. So they are not going to get it for 25,000 years. Then they might send a message back. That'll take another 25,000 years. So I've set my alarm to look for a, a reply. So um, here you can see the solar system with the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth is tipped toward the person. This is the telescope. This is the diameter of the telescope and wavelengths of the message. This is DNA, some amino acids, some binary numbers. We're not sure if they're going to figure this out. Uh, so we could maybe look for these artifacts that are kind of like our television leaving the planet wasn't really meant for ET, or maybe they sent us a deliberate signal. I think if it's an artifact, maybe we'll know that we're not alone, but it'll probably be really hard to figure out what the content is. Um, but if it's deliberate, they'll probably send it anti-cryptographically. They'll make it easy to decode. Maybe they've done this before with other emerging civilizations, so they know how to get started with language lessons or pictures or whatever they know works. Um, and we could learn a lot from such a signal that it's going to be really hard to find emerging civilizations like us that are just sort of primitive. We just invented radio. We just have had FPGAs for 25 years. But the first civilization, you know, that we contact, we can't find them if they're in their primitive state where they're just they just discovered FPGAs. So um, we might find a civilization a billion or two billion years ahead of us. Then we could, you know, learn a lot uh, they're all their music, poetry, literature, science, medicine. That'd be exciting. So at Berkeley, we have a thing called the Berkeley SETI Research Center. Um, we um, are funded by uh, Breakthrough Prize Foundation, National Science Foundation, NASA, individual donors, Xilinx, um, Keysight, Intel, Seagate has helped us out. Um, and we have a, a little more than a dozen people. Students come from engineering, astronomy, physics, uh, and uh, the reason I work on this is because right outside of the astronomy building where I work, there's a parking spaces, but you have to get a Nobel Prize to, to park there. And um, so um, that might be my, my best shot at Nobel Prize is to find ET. So one of, the, one of the ways to kind of optimize the probability of getting a Nobel Prize is to cover a lot of different wavelengths. So the, one of the big problems in SETI is we don't, we don't even know if they're transmitting, but if they are transmitting, something what wavelength is it going to be is it going to be in the radio what you know what frequency in the radio is it going to be in the infrared in the visible part of the spectrum so we have different telescopes that we use looking for different kinds of signals uh, from sort of meter wavelengths up to we're trying to get up into millimeter wavelengths and then we have a couple of things we're doing in the infrared um, but it's sort of spotty coverage here and there we're I'd say earthlings are just getting in the game. We're just learning how to look for these signals. We can't do a thorough search right now, 
But I'm, I, I think in the long run, Earthlings will get better and better at this with the kind of technology that you people develop. Um, you know, it's growing exponentially. And I think, uh, I think right now it's going to be, we, we'd be very lucky to find these signals if they're out there. But, uh, you know, if Moore's Law keeps going, then um, it might happen in our lifetimes if these signals are out there. So one of the first searches that we did was funded by NASA. So NASA requires acronyms. Um, the Serendip is a search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. And the first telescope we used uh, is in Northern California. It's, this is an 85 foot dish. And while we were using this telescope, this is, this is what happened to it. Um, this, this, this is the dish down here. This is, it used to be up on this pedestal. So we moved to a different telescope. This one is in, uh, in West Virginia in a radio quiet zone. This is even bigger, this is 300 feet across. And while we're using this telescope, uh, this is what happened to that telescope. So then we said, okay, we got to move. Then we started doing this optical SETI, uh, looking for laser signals at, at Lick Observatory, which is kind of near where I live and um, near San Jose. Um, I live in Berkeley. And then we had a big fire that came right up to the, the telescope that we use, um, but didn't, luckily. So um, we've had sort of two big accidents and then a fire that came right up to our telescope. So then we've been using this telescope, I'd say for the last 25 years or so. This is um, until recently the world's largest telescope in Puerto Rico, it's called the Arecibo Telescope. It's a thousand feet across. Um, this bowl in the bottom, this reflector, this aluminum reflector holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. And um, so it's, uh, it reflects the, the radio waves up to the receivers here. There's more optics here, a secondary tertiary mirror, and then a, a whole bank of receivers here. And you can move this thing around and cover the sky. And, uh, and then what happened uh, in December um, is uh, a cable broke. And then um, this thing happened. This is, uh, there's the receivers up there on the, on the platform. And uh, then another cable broke. So you might ask, why is this all happening to Dan? And the answer, according to the World Weekly News, is that the aliens did not want to be discovered and all these telescopes are getting zapped by hostile space aliens. Maybe not hostile space aliens, but just aliens that don't want to be discovered. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the algorithms that we use. So the, the first thing that we did was just, let's look for some kind of narrow band signal at some unknown frequency, some unknown wavelength. So this is the kind of thing that um, you can do well with FPGAs. Um, and um, you just do spectrum analysis and you look for kind of a some strong thing that's sticking up out of the noise at some unknown frequency. Um, I wish I could tell you that's, that's ET there, but it's not. It's a satellite going over the dish. We have a big problem. We're looking for extraterrestrial radio signals, but we find terrestrial RFI interfering signals. And that's, of course, getting worse and worse as, as civilization encroaches on these telescopes, which used to be out in the middle of nowhere, um, and people with cell phones and satellites and television and FM radar, all kinds of stuff. Um, we may eventually have to go to the backside of the moon, where the moon would kind of shield us from all the radio pollution. So um, but that's a very expensive proposition. So this may be a kind of unique window in our history where we can still do interesting research. A lot of these windows are still available to us, but um, before they, you know, the whole band gets completely filled up. Well, another kind of thing that we wanted to do is to look for drifting signals. So this is frequency time plot. And here you can see these, or these are uh, signals that are changing in frequency, perhaps due to a accelerating platform, a, a transmitter that's on a spinning planet or a planet going around its star, the, 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 the frequencies change with time. So we're gonna look for this. This was, um, when we started using FPGAs, this was harder to do. I think probably some of you could easily figure out how to program an FPGA to look for these signals. But at the time, 
we did it on kind of standard computers. It takes a lot of computing power because we needed about, um, there, we have about 100 million of these things to do every second. Um, uh, there's a lot of unknowns in, in SETI. We don't know where to point the telescope, where to look. We don't know what frequency. We don't know what kind of signal. Um, so this is a, um, this is kind of a, a, a one-dimensional search. It's just what, you know, what frequency is the signal. This is adds a, a second dimension, what frequency and what drift rate is the signal. And um, then another kind of thing we want to look for is, is kind of a pulsing signal, a bit, 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 bit. This is a frequency time. And you can see I've circled these dots for you so you can see there's a periodic pulse here. But if I remove the circle, it's actually hard to see with your eye. Um, and we have about 100 million of these things to look at every second. Um, so um, one, of the, one of the things that we've been doing, if you, if you just want to analyze a small chunk of the band where you can send it out over the Internet, is we do this thing called volunteer computing or distributed computing, where we record the data from Arecibo. Um, we use the National Energy Supercomputing Center where we have a few petabytes of data. And then we break it up in little chunks. Every volunteer uh, that runs SETI at home gets a different piece of the sky to work on. You download this free screensaver, and then um, you, you are assigned a little piece of data from the Arecibo telescope, about 100 seconds of data. It takes a few days to analyze that. Then the screensaver sends the data back to us. That was a, that was a really sensitive way to analyze a small part of the, of, the, of the band. You could do a very sensitive analysis, coherent integration, a lot of sophisticated um, detection techniques and signal processing. It's not good if you want to have a, a lot of bandwidth um, because you, you can't send high bandwidth data out over the internet, um, at least right now. We might be able to do it later um, when people get you know gigabit or 10 gigabits into their homes. But for high bandwidth data, where we want to look at a, a big chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum, that's when we use uh, FPGAs. Well, we used FPGAs in SETI at home to record the data, um, but not to, to do the bulk of the analysis. Um, for the high bandwidth experiments that we're doing at a bunch of telescopes, the FPGAs do the, the bulk of the, the processing. Um, this is kind of what the SETI at home screensaver looks like. This is what it looks like when it's running on, on your computer. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a little animation of the data going out from Berkeley uh, the yellow dots are what we call the work units. That everybody gets a different part of the sky, a different, uh, different chunk of data. And then when they're finished analyzing the da data, they, the blue dots are coming back to Berkeley, the work units. So they do the bulk, the volunteers do the bulk of the computation. There are 8 million people that signed up for SETI Home in, in 200 countries. And it uh, was one of the biggest supercomputers on the planet. We're really grateful to the volunteers, the most sensitive search that we, we've ever done. Very powerful search because we could look for a huge variety of signals with all that computing power. Um, you can just volunteer with a, with a single computer or a phone, um, but um, this guy's built a cluster of, um, it's called a SETI farm. Um, and I don't know why he's posing in front of his cluster with the bolt cutters. Well, we haven't found ET yet, but, um, I, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about spin-offs. It's like NASA saying, give us more money because we invented Tang and Velcro, but we haven't found anything. So I'll tell you a little bit about spin-offs. One of the spin-offs from SETI at Home was we got a lot of kids engaged in science. And uh, we developed this curriculum for kids um, where they would um, kind of learn. Uh, SETI touches on all these different sciences. Uh, you know, as you think about how did life get started, you learn a little bit about chemistry and biology, and then you learn about astronomy, and you can learn a little computer science when you run your screensaver. You can learn physics. So it, uh, it's a great question to address and get kids. Kids are really interested in this question. Uh, then we kind of made SETI at home more general. This is, by the way, SETI at home and, and Boink are open source codes. So everything we do is open source. We have open source hardware and software. Um, for SETI and other things. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. We made SETI at home more general so you can participate with your home computer uh, in a lot of different science projects. And, um, and so now you can pick from 100 different things that you might want to do and allocate 30% of your spare computing cycles for SETI and 20% for cancer research. And now you can do 
COVID-19 research or global uh, climate change research. This is climate change. This is a gravitational wave. This is uh, searching for black holes. Uh, this is a lot of people now are, are look, looking um, at protein folding, doing uh, looking for new COVID-19 therapeutics. Um, we were also doing a little bit of citizen science uh, projects for things that computers are not good at. Um, we uh, launched a spacecraft out to scoop up some um, dust from a comet and interplanetary dust. And the volunteers kind of go through the uh, millions of photographs looking for these little dust particles. Now there's a lot of these citizen science projects. Another big spinoff are the students. We've had about 100 students work with us and they go off to industry and do uh, fun things. And some of them do a lot of fun things in academia. Okay, I wanna switch from spinoffs kind of back to the things we're working on now and a little bit about FPGA stuff and um, kind of long-term SETI experiments. So one of the new things we're working on is um, an even bigger telescope than Puerto Rico. This is in China, it's called the FAST telescope. It's 500 meters across. And um, it's uh, we're just starting a, a sky survey there. Um, it's going to take three years. Um, and what we're doing is um, we're going to kind of do a raster scan of the sky. And while we're doing that raster scan, we're going to have different experiments. That's not going to be uh, all SETI. We're, we're going to look for new pulsars. We're going to map the galaxy, the hydrogen gas and galaxy and other galaxies. We're going to be searching for fast radio bursts. And then we're gonna be doing a couple of SETI uh, experiments uh, too. Um, and the architecture, by the way, is we used to, every experiment used to digitize their own data and have their own kind of analog digital front ends. But now what we do is digitize it once, we send it into a multicast ethernet switch and all these different experiments can subscribe to different kinds of data. I'll tell you a little bit more, more about that uh, later. Another thing we're working on, there are these new telescopes being built in uh, Australia and in South Africa, which have big deserts that are far away from civilization, so not much RFI, which is really good. This is an artist's conception of the telescope being built in South Africa. Right now they have 64 dishes. They don't have all these dishes, but they're building more and more. And this project is called the Square Kilometer Ray. It's not just for SETI, it's for all kinds of astronomy. Um, it'll be the biggest... Uh, telescope in the world when you add up all those dishes. There's kind of a new way to build telescopes instead of one giant dish, um, you build them out of lots and lots of little dishes. Um, turns out that that's cheaper because um, you'd think the cost of electronics would dominate, but it turns out that the cost of a telescope goes as the, the almost the cube of the diameter because it's really kind of a solid structure. There's a lot of support underneath it. And so the bigger the dish, the, the more the more that cost per collecting area. And as the cost of electronics comes down, the cost of steel doesn't change with time. It's always kind of fixed to the price of hamburger, but the, the cost of electronics is coming down quickly. Um, so these receivers that used to cost a million dollars are now we can build them very cheaply. And, um, and so uh, I think we'll go to smaller and smaller dishes to, uh, to make, uh, um, and right now the kind of cost minimum is, maybe 15 meters across or so, but eventually we might make things out of millions and millions of little dipoles or and things as the cost of electronics and FPGAs comes down. Um, so kind of a new project that I'm excited about that I've been spending a lot of time on lately is this looking for laser signals and we call it uh, a panoramic SETI. We wanna, um, this by the way has a thousand FPGAs and it. it's a joint project of uh, Harvard and UC San Diego and, and Berkeley and, and Caltech. And we, we wanna build something that can look at a big chunk of the sky. And I'll explain why we wanna look at a big chunk of the sky in a second. So this is kind of an artist's conception of what this thing will look like. It's a, it's got, actually, this is one of the domes. We'll, we hope to have several of these domes that open up and expose a whole bunch of telescopes. So we think maybe up to a hundred telescopes um, and each telescope covers, covers 100 square degrees. So if we have 100 telescopes poking out in different directions, we can cover 10,000 square degrees with, um, um, so the thing that we built before 
could look at a little tiny piece of the sky. This is a thing we built at Lick Observatory. And we could look at those little circles there, just little places we pointed, you know, different stars. And, and the problem is that you'd look for five minutes at one star, then five minutes at the next star. But if the signal is, um, is kind of rare, if it's just flashing once a, once a minute, uh, I'm sorry, or once a week or once a month or once a year, we would miss it because we'd be pointing our telescope in one direction and the flash would be coming over from a different direction. The, the field of view in our kind of traditional SETI experiments is it's like looking through a soda straw that's 30 feet long. So you're looking at a little tiny part of the sky, a millionth of the sky. So if there's a flash going off on the other side of the sky, we're going to miss it. So we want to look for this wide field and look at a whole bunch of, and this is only, it's only become possible recently, how to, this possibility looking all sky all the time, not just one little part place in the sky at a time. Uh, the detectors used to be super expensive. Every pixel was a few thousand dollars, but there are these new detectors that were, they become way cheaper because of this. Um, they're used in, in medicine and in, in positron emission tomography, PET uh, medical machines where they, you swallow radioactive dye and it um, goes to your cancer cells. And these detectors, you surround your body with these detectors. They're called silicon photomultiplier tubes and they're about $5 per pixel. And they have kind of nanosecond response. So when a, when a photon hits one of these things, uh, the, you get a nanosecond pulse that's about a million electrons. And that's pretty easy to detect with electronics. You don't need cryogenics. And it's a really nice, well-matched detector. To, and we can kind of cover the sky with these things. Then we need very cheap optics and, and uh, cheap lenses. And we, we found these plastic lenses that you can get uh, called Fresnel lenses. For what you might remember sort of projection TVs, they have these Fresnel lenses in them. And um, then we, FPGAs of course are cheap now. So we have, here's um, 256 pixels. And here's a, you can't see the FPGA, it's on the other side of the board, but you can kind of see the, where it is. And this is some analog electronics that uh, measures the height of the pulses and kind of um, digitizes them and um, time, times them very accurately. So we know when the pulses arrive to kind of nanosecond precision when these flashes of light arrive. And uh, um, then you put four of these boards together and you can get 1,024 pixels. And now you can see the FPGAs on there. And uh, so we have four FPGAs per telescope. That's 400 FPGAs per telescope per, per dome. We hope to have a lot of these domes. So we're gonna have a lot of Kintec 7 FPGAs in this thing to cover the whole sky. Uh, um, they, uh, by the way, you might be interested in the way that we time things very accurately. Um, we use this technology called White Rabbit, which is time transfer and, and frequency transfer over Ethernet. So it, it phase locks all the Ethernet switches together. You know, in, in Ethernet, you might have, when it says a gigabit, it's probably not exactly a gigabit per second. It's, you know, one is 0.999 and one another oscillator might be running at 1.001. But the white rabbit locks all the oscillators in the together of the switches. And then it does time transfer by sending signals back and forth. Um, you have to use uh, uh, one color, use bi-directional. One, um, one fiber, you send a blue light out and red light back and it measures the time very precisely. And you get 30 picosecond time transfer. And then we can time, we can, uh, each FPGA board in the system knows exactly what time it is and um, can, can time tag these things before it sends the data out over the internet. By the way, if you want to add that to your hardware, it's a very little simple open source circuit, it costs about $50 for a VCO and a DAC, and you can stick that on your board. And uh, there's some open source um, gateware and software that that runs on that FPGA. And it's a nice way to have your boards know precisely what, what time it is. Uh, so um, this is the prototype kind of telescope uh, with this Fresnel lens. Um, this is what it looks like at Lick Observatory. We just have a pair of telescopes right now. We don't have hundreds of these, these telescopes and there it is, there they are in the dome. So we're just getting started learning how to do this, but we hope to um, do this with a couple of domes this year and then we'll will scale the project up. And it's looking at a whole new uh, kind of time scale that nobody's really looked at, this sort of nanosecond time scale. And nobody's really done this before. 
not, nobody's even explored the sky at millisecond or microsecond time scales at, at these wavelengths. So it turns out in, 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 we don't understand this with astronomy, but when you look at some new thing in parameter space, if you look at some new wavelength or you just look with more sensitivity or you look at some new time scale, there's some phenomena there that's you, you discovered. You just look somewhere that nobody's looked before and you'll find some new phenomena. It may not be ET, but it may be, we don't understand why nature does that, but it seems to populate every every uh, sort of space with phenomena. You know, the large, tiny, tiny stuff is populated at sort of, you know, 10 to the minus 40 meters, their structure and, and their structure at 100 megaparsecs. And there's, you know, the fractal universe at every wavelength has phenomena, every time scale has phenomena. So we think maybe we won't find ET, but maybe we'll find something new. That'd be kind of fun. Either way, I get that parking space. Well, I'm kind of optimistic in the long run that Earthlings might find ET if, if they're out there. Not right now, but I'm optimistic in the long run because the, the telescope sensitivity is uh, doubling every uh, 3.6 years. We get these big, better and better telescopes, and we're learning how to build these um, big telescopes out of lots of little telescopes um, with a lot of FPGAs. And this is, remember I said that kind of we don't know what wavelength or what frequency to search at. So you want to have a lot of channels. The more channels you have, the better chance you can find them. And the first thing I built in the 70s had 100 channels. And then um, we went to 65, that had 4 billion. Now now I think we have a, a, the latest thing we built has, uh, I think, 20 billion spectral channels. Um, and the number of channels is doubling every 20 months, thanks to the a lot of the work that you guys are doing. Uh, we use a lot of FPGAs for this. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, computing power is increasing, not just FPA, FPGA. I think right now computers are as smart as a, a lizard or as a guppy, but, you know, they're going to get up to the singularity here. That could be very good for SETI, maybe not so good for humans. Um, this is um, kind of in the far future, maybe in 100 years, a way that we could maybe send um, spacecraft much faster uh, out to near the nearby stars so right now spacecraft they don't go much faster than a bullet they go like twenty five thousand miles an hour and that would take um uh, i guess a hundred thousand years to get to the nearest star sort of if you use a kind of conventional rocket um but this is a thing called star shot this doesn't exist yet but the idea is you have a very lightweight uh spacecraft that's just weighs one gram it's a it's a it's a sail it's four meters across just a few atoms thick. And then you have this laser on the ground that's 50 gigawatts and you shine light against it um, and uh, for about two minutes. And that thing accelerates at about 20 Gs. And in two minutes, it gets up to about 20% 20, um, 20, uh, the speed of light. And that means it'll get to the nearest star in 20 years and maybe send a picture back of planets going around the nearest star or something like that. Like, don't hold your breath on this. That may be 100 years away or something like that. But we're beginning to think about that. Uh, another thing that's maybe 100 years away is um, um, a really big telescope. So it turns out um, Einstein figured out that uh, light bends around things that have gravity. And the sun acts like a gravitational lens. And so um, you can use the sun as a giant telescope. Uh, the problem is it focuses. The focus is way beyond Pluto, um, so you have to get your camera way out there. But if you could do that, you'd have 10 meter resolution on an extrasolar planet. So you couldn't quite read license plates, but we, we, you know, we could see their big structures. We could see their FPGA plants and stuff like that. Um, so um, another kind of big spinoff from SETI is this. Um, what we found was um, we were building these pretty powerful processors with FPGAs and later with GPUs uh, for SETI. And we are kind of developing architecture and tools to, to build these SETI instruments. We found that that was useful for a lot of radio astronomy. And so we began sort of helping other groups um, use the hardware that we had developed for SETI to do pulsar research and um, look for all kinds of radio astronomy phenomena. And we that turned out into a big collaboration called CASPER, which is the Collaboration for Radio Astronomy Signal Processing Electronics Research. 
And the goal was to kind of develop open source hardware and open source kind of signal processing libraries and tools to make it easy to program FPGAs and to build kind of heterogeneous machines where you're combining FPGAs with GPUs and CPUs. And we worked on kind of architectures and, and we um, a lot. Uh, another goal was to kind of train people so astronomers could learn how to build instruments. Thousand people that are working together to develop this open source uh, infrastructure and, and build radio astronomy instruments. And we have a lot of tutorials and we have workshops and every, all the students build a spectrometer and they build a correlator and they learn how to use Simulink and make a um, build radio astronomy instruments and they learn how to um, send high speed ethernet, you know, 10, 100, 100 gigabit ethernet. Um, and we have these workshops where in the morning we have talks, in the afternoon we do trainings and working groups. And also every year we have kind of the busy weeks where the hotshots get together and we have board porting workshops. We have a lot of support for people on a mailing list and Slack and telecons. And we're what we're trying to do is to kind of figure out how to build scalable architectures that are kind of easy to upgrade plat so that when, when uh, Altera or Xilinx come out with a come new platform that's uh, we want to somehow make it so that we can reuse our our gateware without you know rewriting the stuff. Uh, so the architecture that we've been using is kind of connect everything with Ethernet. Um, we we think Ethernet's going to be around for a while, and so the architecture is you you have a a bank of antennas, uh, maybe just one antenna or maybe a thousand, and you. You try to digitize that data as close to the front end as possible, maybe at RF. If, you, if it's at high frequency, maybe you digitize at IF frequencies. And then that goes into an FPGA. And there, the FPGA will timestamp the data coming from the antenna. And it might send out just time domain data, just voltage as a function of time. Or it might channelize it with something called a polyphase filter bank or a FFT. Is a, uh, polyphase filter bank is just the same as an FFT, but good. Uh, isolation between channels. And then, so you might get time domain data or frequency domain data, or it might send both uh, both of those kinds of data into a big switch. And then on the back of the switch, you have computing modules, um, which could be FPGAs or GPUs or CPUs, or um, a lot of people have a combination of things and they put uh, FPGAs, as you know, are very good at kind of integer computation. And, um, and then Float, uh, floating point, sometimes they'll move into the GPUs and the CPUs do some of the stuff that's not requiring a lot of bandwidth. And then you can kind of dynamically allocate, I'm sorry, dynamically allocate how you want your thing to be used. You might, astronomers might say, okay, I want these things to correlate, make a spectral image. I want some beam forming here. I want these things to do pulsar timing or these things to do SETI. And they can, if this is a multicast switch, different processing platforms can subscribe to different data. They can you know, say, I want the time domain data, I want the frequency domain data, or I want data from these antennas. Um, we think it's a good kind of scalable architecture. And then when these things get old, you can unplug them and plug the latest FPGAs into your, into your system. We try to avoid using backplanes because as you guys know, they don't last very long. If you're really old like I am, you know about the S100 bus and multibus and uh, you know, PCIe's gone through a lot of different changes. So we, but we think Ethernet is likely to be around for a while. Ethernet's been around since '73, and um, you know, right now, 10, 40, 100 gigabit is kind of in fashion. But um, you know, eventually, it'll be terabit or whatever petabit Ethernet. But there'll always be some adapters. We think that you know, convert one kind of Ethernet to another. Little boxes you can buy these kind of things right now, and and you get you know, you can get these little transceivers that send data out, um, you know, 100 gigabits to 10 terabits over, you know, if it's uh, multicolored kind of CWDM um, stuff, uh, you get, send data out 40 kilometers, pretty cheap ways to send data over long. So this is kind of, um, we have a lot of different ADC boards. There's, you can go to our website, casper.berkeley.edu, and you can look at all the open source analog digital converter boards. This is a quad. 15 giga sample ADC board hooked into a commercial board. This is a, a Xilinx board uh, that has an ultra scale plus on it. And what you know, what we like about these kind of, these new boards is uh, that they have a lot of Ethernet. This is these are 
100 gigabit Ethernet ports. There are four of them on there. Um, of course, it's a very powerful chip too. And, uh, and it goes into a little FMC connector. Um, we used to build our own FPGA boards. We still do. There's about a dozen open source boards that you can use from Casper and we have vendors you can buy them. You can build them or you can buy them from vendors that tested boards. Um, and uh, But now we're finding that the vendors can come up with boards faster than we can. We used to build our own because most boards didn't have ethernet at the time, but now almost all boards have, well, at least the high-end boards have high, high speed ports on them. Uh, this is a, another example of a board. I'm sorry, this is a, a board that's got 12 ADCs and an FPGA and some ethernet. It's got, um, um, and some, you know, things that clock the FPGAs and um, stuff like that, synthesizers. And uh, it's a nice inexpensive board. We have even, we, we have a kind of $200 entry level board that students can use. It's not high bandwidth. It's just a few hundred mega samples per second. Um, it, uh, it's, it's just a commercial board you get called Red Pattaya. That's what we find is a good kind of educational board. This is kind of an intermediate board that uh, you can sample at a giga sample. And then the high end boards can go up to 26 giga sample per second uh, ADCs. And we're starting to play with 55 giga sample ADCs. Um, that, those instruments are now on the back of all major telescopes or almost all the big telescopes. And they led to the first images of, of a black hole, uh, that Event Horizon Telescope, that all came from FPGAs. Um, it led to the discovery of fast radio bursts, these very mysterious things that are uh, last about a millisecond. They're the brightest thing in the sky. Um, and uh, most pulsars that have been discovered are, are from this instrumentation that came from FPGAs and SETI. Um, this led to um, new equations of state, finding the most massive pulsars, learning how, you know, down what's down in deep inside the atom uh, in the nucleus. Uh, it led to the discovery of, of a planet made out of solid diamond. That was done on FPGAs. It's also used outside of radio astronomy. Um, in, for, in physics experiments, this is neutron radiography. Um, it's uh, used in some medical research. We wanted to get, um, instead of having a, uh, when you want to get data outside out of a brain, you put electrodes in there. And we, we wanted to do kind of a wireless thing um, so you don't have to have a bunch of wires for each electrode coming out of your brain. So um, we worked with people at Berkeley Wireless Research Center. They have these little chips that have electrode arrays with 256 electrodes and a little tiny uh, milliwatt transmitter. And we built the thing that receives the data and does the beam forming. And uh, you get about 10 megabits per second um, out of your brain. And we hope eventually it'll get used for kind of um, prosthetic uh, control um, and uh, maybe um, kind of research, medical research. So um, what, we've, what we've been working on is kind of this idea of platform independent uh, gateway, uh, where when a new board comes out, we, we wanna kind of minimize the effort to take advantage of, of the latest FPGAs. And uh, we've been using Simulink um, and we try to kind of wrap Linux around it. Uh, so the, um, the, the boards kind of look like they're in a Linux environment and the registers and memory that are in the FPGA uh, on, or on the board are kind of mapped into a Linux environment. Um, and uh, it, these designs kind of look like you have some ADCs on the left. Uh, here's some, here's some like ADCs and then you might have some signal processing on the output. There can be some ethernet blocks and, a, um, and you connect them all together and, uh, um, and when you when you plunk down this your design to say what board do you want to compile it for, and so you, you can sort of target different platforms without having to redesign your your software. Hey Dan, we uh, have about ten minutes left, and actually, uh, okay. actually, what you're talking about there's a there's a question related exactly to what you're talking about that that as you get new hardware. Do your algorithms change? Do the things that you can discover change? And does your thinking change? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things we'd like to do that we can't do. So uh, like, for instance, we um, we wanted to do coherent integration, which is way more sensitive than incoherent integration. And when 
you know, bigger FPGAs came out that had more power and, you know, uh, more memory. Uh, we're starting to do coherent integration. So, um, and then we're, we also want to do sort of, we, we're not sure that we know exactly what kind of signal ET, what kind of modulation ET might be doing. And it's hard to design all these different match filters. And so it might be something we haven't thought of. So we're also interested in kind of anomaly detection, some, you know, machine learning thing that just looks for weird stuff that you haven't thought of. Just say, hey, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and so we're starting to think about that. So the algorithms are changing. I think maybe I should shut up and um, I just kind of have a summary slide here if you haven't been paying attention. Um, no ET so far, um, still working on it. So thank you. And I think um, I appreciate your uh, saying, let's move to questions, uh, Michael. Um, so I'm hoping some of you will have questions and comments. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, the thing I, I think I've learned most is that if I own a telescope, I'm not letting you use it. <laughs> yeah, be careful. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the Casper system that you're building, where you've built an architecture with interconnect with lots of different accelerators and, and CPUs and other components and sort of throw in the hardware at someone and said, well, now you map the algorithm to it. Have, have you um, built tools for helping people decide which accelerator to use for different phases and experimented with the interconnect there? Um, so the interconnect that we use is always ethernet. It might be 10 or 40, 100 gigabit ethernet. And we do have tools. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems, not with FPGAs, you know, FPGAs are really good at IO. You know, you can have, uh, you know, terabits per second coming out of a, a single FPGA now with all these fancy CERTES that um, they keep getting faster and faster and there are more and more of them on a chip. But one of the problems that's a bottleneck for us in radio astronomy is uh, sometimes uh, GPUs, we found that they're IO bound uh, and, and uh, not FPGAs, but GPUs are IO bound. So we have a lot of tools for just data transport, getting data into a computer and getting it into a GPU board uh, through, you know, from the NIC, through the motherboard, into the GPU. So we have some open source tools for doing that. Um, uh, but it's still a it's still a bottleneck. But I, I, these new GPU boards from NVIDIA that haven't quite come out yet have a couple of Ethernet ports, 100 gigabit ports right on the GPU. And that, so we won't have to, you know, go through the motherboard, through the, through the network interface card. Um, one of the kind of um, how to partition the design between GPUs and CPUs and FPGAs is still a kind of an artistic, you know, how, how, if you have this big thing that you want to do, how do you partition? How many GPUs should you use? How many FPGAs should you use? I had a student, Terry Philibo, who did a, her PhD on kind of auto partitioning. And you could kind of pick your figure of merit. Do you want to optimize for cost or do you want to optimize for power consumption or whatever your figure of merit was. And it would say, okay, move this into GPUs, move this into FPGAs. And that is still a kind of researchy project. It's not a sort of open source code that's ready to go. But um, I, I think that would be kind of a, a long-term way it would be not so artistic. Let's move this here and this there, but more kind of here's, a, here's an optimization. Here's how to do it depending on your figure of merit. Well, that's some of the expertise of the people at this conference. And um, so if someone here wants to get involved, how would they do it? Uh, well, I, I think uh, email me in the Casper email list and say, hey, we have some tools that may be of interest in auto partitioning a design. But we'd be, we'd be very keen to work with those people. OK. Um, there's a question about your use of Ethernet, that it, that, um, it tends to be block-based and presents challenges for streaming data. How do you work with that? Yeah, so it is packetized so that the, the um, we send, first we send UDP, we're not doing TCP IP because it, we, in rate astronomy, you don't care if you miss a bit or some or two. So the, 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 the data are time stamped. Uh, so it, they're, they're synchronized, all the FPGA boards are synchronized, so they're sampling together. The FPGAs are timestamping the Ethernet packets, but after that, it's globally asynchronous. So the GPUs and the FPGA boards that are analyzing the data, 
they they know when the packets arrive, they know what time that corresponds to. So the packets can arrive out of order. You know, when they go through switches and stuff, the packets can arrive in di as the questionnaire points out in different blocks and they can come in different packets out of order. Then the the Jeep, the they're assembled in the order that they were meant to be assembled with these timestamps on the packets. And then the, the, the algorithms go to work on them. Okay, so so you've you've kind of buffered in a way that it will all arrive at the right time. Right. So when when they, um, yeah, you have to. We have typically kind of big circular buffers that are you know a gigabyte or something, and you, you as the packets come in, you kind of assemble them, and then when you get enough packets, then you analyze it. Uh -huh. But the um, the question is right. It's all real time streaming. This the, all this stuff that we do in radio astronomy, you have to keep up with the data. So the FPGAs are synchronous, but the GPUs and the CPUs and the FPGAs that are doing the Ethernet processing, they have to they have to be at least a little faster than the data flow. Are you using the FPGAs to filter data in order to avoid having to write it out to disk, or is that not a problem for you? Oh yeah, so the, the data, so in a big system, we have 100 terabits per second, and there's no way to record that kind of data. So the, there's a huge amount of data compression going on in these real-time systems. Um, we we uh, so that the data might be compressed by a factor of a hundred before it, before it gets written on the disk. So that the FPGAs and the GPUs are doing the bulk of the signal processing, and then so we're not typically we're not recording raw data to disk. There are some experiments uh, where we have hundreds of disk drives um, and we can stream the voltage data, but uh, most of the time, there's a huge compression going on in, in the FPGAs. I assume it's lossy. How do you decide what to throw away and what to keep? <laughs> yeah. So in the, the simple SETI experiments, you, you take a spectrum and you just look for signals that are above, above the noise at some threshold, and you just archive that. You know, I found a strong signal at this frequency and this time, and this is where... The, so that's a big compression. There's, you know, there's lots of ways to compress, but oftentimes it's sort of, you know, sort of thresholding and then just recording data on what you think are the strong signals. Hmm. You uh, mentioned early in the talk, um, thinking of, of collecting from space. Is, is there any work going on on that? And what would be some of the new challenges? Yeah, so there, there, the ionosphere blocks frequencies below 10 megahertz and, um, and uh, ab above uh, there's certain anyway. There's a lot of frequencies we we cannot access on Earth, and so you want to go into space for that. And uh, so it, it's there are some telescopes that are kind of small in size that um, we're starting to think about to to do SETI experiments, but we haven't done anything in space yet. It's just sort of starting to think about it. We're also talking about. Um, telescopes on the moon, the backside of the moon, but it's it's all talk so far. The backside of the moon doesn't count as space. Uh, that's space. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought there was a question back there that I'd forgotten. Oh, there, there was a, a, an out there question. Um, could we use cell phones as, as collectors? There's a huge distributed oh, collector. Yeah, we haven't figured out a way to phase up cell phones. So the, pr the problem is that um, if you want to collect from lots of little telescopes, you need to, to add those signals back up in phase. So, you know, if you're looking at, um, let's say you're looking at signals that are a, a gigahertz, uh, at a gigahertz frequency, RF frequency, um, you need to know what time it is. Each cell phone would have to know what time it is so it can timestamp the phase of that data to better than nanosecond precision. And, so, and uh, you know, the cell phones the G have GPS. GPS there, precision is not accurate it, enough. No. That's too bad. So this session is going to close in uh, 40 seconds. Um, so thank you so much for coming. It, it was interesting to hear a, sort of a, a, a similar problem to what we heard yesterday of, of Large Hadron data collection with a different take on it. Um, the breakout room, this, this session will move to the breakout room, Dan, I hope you'll follow.
and hit yeah, the right button you, so that you'll be there. Okay. Is it obvious which break? I'll figure. I'll figure it, it out. It's I'll going to direct you to it, and then there will be a button that says uh, "Enter the room." And okay, so do that, and then turn on your mic and camera again. I believe. Okay. Do it. Thanks, everybody. Sure.